Okay. So we're looking at the theme of Purim and its similarity with Yom Kippur. If you take the word Yom Kippur and you translate it, if I, if, you know, if, I, if I told you this before five minutes ago, you'd say Day of Atonement, and you'd be absolutely correct. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, that's correct. But actually, if you translated Yom Kippurim, literally, literally, Yom Kippurim, I'll say it this way, Yom Kippurim, a day <laughs> like Purim is the literal translation of Yom Kippurim. Isn't that amazing? I'll say it slowly. Yom Kippurim. So Yom Kippurim translates as a day like Purim. That's wild. Now it's wild because not only is that a, a, an incredible translation, but if you step back for a second, and you compare those days, oh, you'll find that they could not be more dissimilar. Oh. They could not be more dissimilar. Purim is for feasting. Yom Kippur is for fasting. Purim is for silliness. Yom Kippur is for, is for seriousness. Purim is for eating and drinking. It's a mitzvah to have a, a big meal. Yom Kippur is for fasting. Purim is a regular day. We do what we, 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 we you drive, you use electricity. Yom Kippur is, is a Shabbat. It's a holy day. So they're actually opposites to one another. They're opposites. We have such fun oh. that we wear a mask and dress up in costume. On Yom Kippur, we wear a burial shroud and there's a custom of wearing a kittel. There's a custom of Yom Kippur of wearing a white kittel to remind us of the day of death, a burial shroud. So it's all very well and fine to say that they're similar, Yom K, Purim. But what are you talking about? They couldn't be more, more different. So with that introduction, I'd like to share with you a couple of thoughts of classic Jewish philosophy. We start with Reb Sadok HaKohen. I, this is very weird because I, one of the greatest things in the world, for me, speaking personally now, I've not been able to wrap my head around international travel. I still can't get over it. I can't get over it. I can be walking the streets of Montreal in the morning and walking the streets of Europe in the, in the evening on the same day. For me, maybe it's a function of the fact that I don't travel often. But I am amazed every single time I get on a plane and I'm walking that same day later, the streets of London, Israel, I find that one of the greatest wonders of the world. I can't get over it. So yesterday, I stood at the grave of this person of text number one, Hasidic. Whoa. Hasidic wow. Rebbe who lived 200 years ago, Whoa. I was in Lublin. Whoa. One of the famous, most famous rabbis of Lublin was the Hasidic Rebbe, <laughs> Rav Sadok HaKohen. Mm -hmm. Profound writer, profound thinker. He wrote libraries worth of books. He, he wrote so many books, so many different volumes. One of the one of the greatest, in terms of quantity, one of the greatest writers of our people. And in terms of the content, you might be saying to yourself, well, how come I've never heard of him before? He writes as deep as deep gets. Very, very deep connection with Kabbalah, 
significant. And he writes terse. He expects you to know all of Chumash, all of the Torah, all of the Tanakh, all of the Mishnah, all of the Midrash, every Jewish legend, all of the Talmud, and all of the commentaries. And because he's assuming that you know all of that, he just throws out a line here, a line there, and he's expecting you in your head to make all of the connections and understand what he's saying. <laughs> so it's very hard to get through. Let's see a tiny little section of Reb Sadok. In the Midrash, it is written, all of the festivals will eventually be nullified, while the days of Purim will never be nullified. As it says, these days of Purim will not depart from the Jews and their memory will not cease to be remembered by their descendants. We actually saw that Midrash a couple of classes ago. Do you remember that? Amazing Midrash, amazing legend. In the future, there will be no Jewish holidays. There's only going to be one Jewish holiday, Purim. Amazing. But now look what Reb Sadok adds. In addition, now he's saying this on his own. There's no Midrash. There's no source for this. He's making this up. He's a Hasidic Rebbe. He's allowed. In addition, Yom Kippur will never be nullified. Now, he brings a proof for this. If you look in the Torah in Vayikra, Vayikra 16, how does the Torah describe Yom Kippur? Vahayta zot lachem lechukat olam. This is actually a very ordinary verse, and it will be for you an eternal decree. The Torah uses that expression often. What does it mean? This will be an eternal decree. Ordinarily, when we read that pasuk, when we read that verse from the Torah, you'll do this always. There will always be Yom Kippur. That's an ordinary thing to say. The Torah says that a whole bunch of times. Rabbi Sarok is poetically reading that. And he's making a connection. Just like the Midrash says, Purim will always exist in the times of the Messiah. In the future, when all of the holidays will end, Purim will still be there. So too will Yom Kippur. As it says, it will be an eternal statute. He's reading that verse almost like as a drush. He's reading that verse poetically. Don't read it the way we always read that verse in the Torah. There will always be Yom Kippur. No, no, he's taking it to a deeper level. Yom Kippur also will not be nullified in the future. Do you see what he's doing? Am I explaining it clearly? In other words, just like Purim is eternal, Yom Kippur is eternal. And Reb Sadok is making a connection between them. Fascinating. Let's go to source two. Rabbi Shimshon Pincus. We saw him last week, and I said he's actually a 20th century thinker. I think he died maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Not, not long ago. This is a contemporary. This is a contemporary. Take, take a look. The Maharal... By the way, Maharal lives in Prague, 1600s. Famous Jewish rabbi and thinker. The Maharal explains that the reason these two days, Purim and Yom Kippur, will never be nullified, is that they both pertain to the very existence of Israel as a people. Were it not for Yom Kippur, transgression would overcome us, God forbid. Let's stop there. What does Yom Kippur do? It wipes the slate clean, correct? What's Yom Kippur? A day of atonement. Yom Kippur, what, what does Yom Kippur do? Gives us another chance. Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, Dibarnu, Dofi. We made a mistake. We came up short. Let me ask you a question. Could you imagine never having Yom Kippur? What would happen? We'd all walk around depressed. What would happen? We'd all be sinners. 
uh, our lives will be too heavy for us to bear. You know what happens at the end of Yom Kippur? You're given a new lease on life. I'm sure you felt it. It can't just be me. Yom Kippur finishes. 25 hours are over. The chauffeur sounds. What happens? Oh, I feel like a million dollars. Right? And it's not because you're running to dinner. Don't, don't think it's because you're going to your breakfast. I got to tell you something. I'm not even hungry at that point. If you ask me in the middle of the day around lunchtime, I'm hungry. But once I hear the chauffeur, I'm just happy. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever just, it's just a, a joy. It's a pure simcha, a joy. I'm alive. All of my sins have been forgiven. I've got a new lease on life. I'm going to be a better person this year. I'm going to really do it the right way this year. You must have felt that way. You must. It can't just be me. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yom Kippur has given me life. If it wouldn't be for Yom Kippur, well, we, we wouldn't be able to make it. And likewise, on Purim, I'm continuing reading now. I'm over here. And likewise, on Purim, we were rescued from the terrible decree of, quote, this is from the Megillah, to destroy, to kill, and to wipe out all the Jews. They're the same holiday. What's the similarity? We wouldn't be able to survive if it wasn't for Yom Kippur. And Purim was all about being able to survive. We nearly got wiped out. Both the joy of Purim and the feeling of Yom Kippur are thus grounded in the essence of life itself. On Yom Kippur, a person feels that he has been given a chance to live in the future, despite his past, her past. The joy of Purim, on the other hand, is for life itself. The feeling of joy for life itself never fades. Just as the joy a person feels on his birthday is never diminished, since that is the day that his life was given to him or her. It therefore emerges that the joy of Purim is not because of the past, on account of the great miracle that God performed for that generation, but rather for the feeling of joy for life that is renewed in each and every generation. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. This will change your Purim. Purim is this Wednesday night. It's in six days. What do we celebrate? We're not celebrating something that happened in the past a long time ago. We're celebrating that we're alive today. There's a renewed feeling each and every day. We're alive. Didn't have to be that way. And yet we are here. We are alive. That's joy. Amazing. Let's go on a little bit. Rabbi Yitzhak Hutna. Rabbi Yitzhak Hutna. I think we saw him as well a couple of weeks ago. Um, born in Poland think or Lithuania not sure where he was born died in Israel lived most of his life in New York was the Rosh Yeshiva at the Yeshiva Torah excuse me Chaim Berlin Chaim Berlin famous Yeshiva in Brooklyn New York he was there for decades let's take a look at Rav Hutna we have already mentioned on several occasions the holy words of the Vilna Gaon, who explains the teaching of the sages that Purim and the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim, are the same nature. The Vilna Gaon explained that we find in the Talmud, Beitza 15b, concerning all festivals, a teaching of half for God and half for you. What does that mean, half and half? It's a beautiful Talm Talmudic piece. Let me just go off and explain. explain. In the Talmud, it says, all of the festivals, half for God, half for us. During the festivals, we have to go to shul and daven and pray. 
That's half for God. But then that's a mitzvah. You know what the other mitzvah of the festivals are? Go home and fress. <laughs> Make sure you buy a big chocolate cake or a bottle of scotch. And believe it or not, that's a mitzvah. When it comes to the festivals, half for us as well. Can't just be all one way. Can't just be all God. It's got to be half for us as well. Isn't that a beautiful Talmudic statement? You're going to enjoy your holiday the next time you have a holiday, right? By the way, it's very Jewish. This, this piece of Talmud is very Jewish. You get a little and I get a little, right? You can like, if you say it with a Yiddish accent, a little sing song, a little bit for you, a little bit for me. That is what the Talmud says is every Jewish holiday. Half for God, half for us. Beautiful. Okay. Let's go back to the teaching. The Vilna Gaon explained concerning this teaching in the Talmud in Beitzah, half for God, half for you. Meaning that the festivals mandate us both to perform religious duties towards God and also to enjoy ourselves in physical ways. In this sense, listen to this. This is beautiful. Listen to what Rav Hutner says. Purim and Yom Kippurim are two halves of one whole. Yom Kippurim comprising the half for God and Purim being the half for you. Yes. Two halves of the same whole. Do you get it? What do we do on Yom Kippur? The whole day is for God. The whole day you're in Shul, the whole day you're doving it. Can't even have a Yom Tov meal. We don't make Kiddush. There's no meal, there's no Kiddush on Yom Kippur. What's Purim? The whole day is craziness. Costumes and Mishlo Achmanot and gifts to the poor. It's, it's all about humans. It's all, and, and drinking and eating and getting drunk. Yom Kippur and Purim are two halves of the same whole. They're the same festival. Just like every festival is half for God, half for us. We find that with Yom Kippur and Purim, half for God, half for us. Shrugger Simons, contemporary, still alive. This is taken from the Aish website, Aish.com. Amazing website. Listen to the following. Contrasting Purim and the Day of Atonement, we would assume that Yom Kippur is the greater of the two days. But in one sense, Purim is even greater. It is easier to achieve spiritual elevation on a day like Yom Kippur. When we pray and we have no time for forbidden activities like gossip or getting angry. By fasting, the soul achieves dominance over the body. But on Purim, in our state of rambunctious drunkenness, it is much harder to maintain our human dignity. As Rabbi Eliyahu Kitov writes, if one attains holiness through affliction and another attains holiness through indulgence, who is the greater of the two? It may be said that the one who attains holiness through indulgence is greater. For the attainment of holiness through indulgence requires an infinitely greater degree of striving and effort. <laughs> In this way, the challenge of Purim is greater. Literally translated as a day like Purim. It's, Yom Kippur is just a day like Purim. When you say like something else. What's always bigger? What's always better? The thing you're comparing it to, right? Oh, wow. That, that is, my car is like a Ferrari. It goes so fast, it's like a Ferrari. What is, what is better? The thing you compare it to, right? That's always bigger. That's always better. So if Yom Kippurim is a day, Yom Kippurim, it's just a day it's only a day like purim what's the bigger what's the better what are we comparing it to you know what's the amazing day purim is the amazing day yom kippur ah nothing that's yom kippur anyone can be religious on yom kippur i'm in shul all day i'm fasting all day it's easy to be religious on yom kippur but you know what's hard 
to be holy on Purim. According to Jewish thought, the last and only people to see the world in a state of perfection were Adam and Eve. The Garden of Eden means a perfect world. How did Adam and Eve fall from that state? By eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That is, they pursued the world of illusion in which the transcendence of the universe is masked by seeming imperfection. Whoa, there's a lot there in that one sentence. What does eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil mean? What does that mean? It means they pursued the world of illusion in which the transcendence of the universe, goodness, this world that God made is good. God sees and creates a world it was good. But this world of illusion seemingly masks that goodness, and we see a world of evil. That's what it means to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to pursue that world of illusion. If we approach Purim correctly, when we reach the tipsy state of no longer knowing good from evil, we actually realign our perspective by seeing the transcendent as the source of all physical reality, thereby revealing its hidden perfection. Therefore, Purim at its peak is like a taste of the Garden of Eden. The potential for spiritual elevation on Purim is tremendous. As we're drinking and partying, we should keep this in mind and not let the opportunity fly by. When we drink and we get a bit tipsy and we no longer know good from evil, we're actually realigning our intellect on the highest level. We're actually going back to the Garden of Eden. Wow. This Rabbi, is Rabbi, I have a question. Purim and Yom Kippur. Question. Are we allowed to celebrate Purim when we have 200 to 300 sisters and brothers in the state they're in right now? Not only can we, but we must. We absolutely must. Because... The greatest thing that the Jewish people can do right now is be the greatest Jewish people that we can be. Because if we live up to our destiny and our calling, that itself becomes a part of what will heal this world. So not only can we celebrate Purim this year, we must celebrate Purim this year. One more thing, I suggest that we take the big, one of the biggest mitzvahs of Purim, which is Siraka, at Shul this year, and take all that money and send it straight to the Ukraine in their honor this year. Yeah, I was going to do exactly that. Sir. I was going okay. to do exactly that. Now, the Sadaka distributed is Matanot Le'evyonim. It actually should be um, Sadaka so that a poor person can eat their Purim Suda. So interestingly, that Sadaka does have a Purim aspect to it. But yes, the Sadaka raise will certainly be going to help the Ukrainian effort. Okay. Friends, it's late. I'm going to pause here. And this brings to a conclusion our far, four classes that we have been looking at over the last four or five weeks. I skipped a week. So we've had four classes over five weeks. I hope this has been insightful. I hope this has been interesting. I hope you've gotten some new ideas on for him. And I hope that you've been able to deepen your connection with Purim so that when it comes to this Wednesday night, when we read the Megillah, which will be on Zoom, by the way, if you're still not comfortable coming into Shul, we will have the Megillah on Zoom. Um, 
I hope that this Purim is celebrated in the most beautiful of ways and that you can have a beautiful, holy Purim. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much, everybody. Have a good Thank night. You, Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for your attendance. Rabbi. Just seeing Thank you at you, a class has given me such encouragement. Thank you. And I wish you all well. Have a good night. And uh, an you, early, an early much, good Rabbi. Shabbos. An Thank early good you, Shabbos. Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank All the best. Shabbat Shalom. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi, for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.